Good morning, everybody. My name is Marsha Levy, and I'm the Executive Director of Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VOLS, which for 35 years has provided free legal services to low-income New Yorkers in partnership with over 200 community organizations and over 60 law firms and companies to represent immigrants, seniors, veterans, small businesses, incarcerated mothers, children, the unemployed, and most recently, frontline and healthcare workers. When we conceived of this summit, which I'm welcoming you to today, which is VOL's Leadership Summit, aligning pro bono and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives to better serve our communities, we never thought that we would be having the summit remotely. It was supposed to happen on March 11th. And we certainly never thought that we would be having it in the light of COVID-19 and in the recent protests, angst, despair, and maybe a little bit of hope that we're seeing in light of the murder of George Floyd and the reaction of our community, our country, and internationally to those events. And so, as it turns out, this is a perfect time to be having this conversation, which was a conversation to think about how as pro bono professionals and diversity, equity, inclusion professionals within law firms, law schools, companies, legal service organizations, and community organizations, we work together to best serve our communities. Before we go on to the panel discussion, our plenary, I want to first thank our co-sponsors. First and foremost, Thomson Reuters, which has been an amazing, amazing partner, helping us through the first uh, plenary that we had panel uh, um, we had scheduled back in March of 2020, and through now and the West Legal Education Center. And I have to give a particular shout out to Lara Sheikh, who's the senior attorney editor in practical law at Thomson Reuters, who has been our steadfast partner since the day we started talking about this. And to thank our steering committee, you can see the slide right now, and also our co-sponsors, and you can see their names up above, the Association of Corporate Pro Bono, the Association of Law Firm Diversity Professionals, the Association of Pro Bono Council, the New York City Bar Association, and the Public Interest Pro Bono Association. Before I turn it over to the panel, I want to remind people that this is now in two parts. We'll be convening again on June 11th. And while this plenary is for CLE credit, the others won't be, but the added feature of the next two, which will happen on June 11th, will be that they will be interactive. We'll even break up into rooms to be able to talk. The final thing I want to say is something somebody taught me just within the last two, 24 hours. And she said to me, we're born with two ears and one mouth. We're given two ears so we can listen more and talk less. Today is gonna to be an opportunity to listen and it's gonna be an opportunity to talk. And we look forward to hearing what our plenary panelists and facilitator will say. So without any more talk from me, because I'm gonna put my ears on and listen, I'm going to introduce Paula Edgar, who's the partner at Inclusion Strategy Solutions, LLC, and the immediate past president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Paula, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Marsha. Um, and thank you everyone who is uh, listening at this time. Uh, first, I would like to, to just say to everyone who's on the line, um, I hope that you're managing well in light of all that we're all going through. Um, as Marsha mentioned, when we first talked about this, you know, I was excited that we were all gonna be on stage and we were gonna be <laughs> in front of an audience and, and talking about this. Um, and then COVID-19 hit. And I'll talk from a personal perspective in that um, it really uh, derailed me for multiple reasons, um, including being an extrovert <laughs> um, and not being able to interact with people the way I'd like, but more so, um, and very indicative of what has happened to black communities. I had several deaths in my family 
and as well as in the um, sort of corollary of my community. And then George Floyd, and then Breonna Taylor, uh, and then Ahmaud Arbery. Um, and so there has been a deluge on, on our communities. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful privilege it would be to be able to steward this conversation now when the leaders who you're about to hear from are really at the front lines in terms of their institutions in being the difference that we all need to be. And so whenever I do training and I do diversity training and consulting, I say to folks, if you leave here and don't do anything, then we have all wasted our time, right? And so I know that all of you are the ones who are going to be the ones on the front lines as well. And so I'll say to you this, make sure that there's something that is a charge even more so than the charge that you already have that you leave this with. The leaders who are gonna to talk to you are gonna talk from their perspectives um, from their different institutions. Um, and each of us individually and institutionally have a, a charge here. We need you now more than ever. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce, I'm gonna tell you all of their names and I'm gonna ask each of one of them to introduce themselves um, and give a little bit of context about how uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and pro bono um, merge in their, within their institutions. So our panel consists of the following. Thomas Kim, who is the Tom, Thompson Reuters Chief Legal Officer. Kim Cooper-Smith, who is a partner and chairperson at Aiken Lee, Strauss, Hauer, and Fells. Mary Lou Bilek, who is the Dean of CUNY Law School. Roger Maldonado, who is a partner at Smith, Gabrell, and Russell, and the immediate past president of the New York, Bar, New York City Bar Association. And so, I'm sorry, and also I apologize that Lillian Moy, who is um, the executive director at uh, Legal Services in, and I apologize because I haven't had a, 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 I apologize, Lillian. It's okay. Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. My apologies. And so each of them in their, in their roles are leaders within their institutions. And so Lillian, I'm actually gonna start with you to introduce okay. yourself and to tell us a little bit about how DEI and pro bono are prioritized for you and your institution and tell us about a little bit about what you do. Sure. Well, I'm the executive director of a 16 county legal services program. We handle everything from the Catskills to Canada. And for us, um, our we have a very, very diverse, but differently diverse service area, right? Much of it is rural, white, monolingual, but significant communities of color and linguistic and linguistic minorities, especially in our cities of Albany, Schenectady, Troy, and Amsterdam. We have an institutional commitment to diversity within. Um, we begin by orientation of new staff, including a segment on cultural humility. In our pro bono trainings, we try to include an excerpt or section on cultural humility as well, or cultural competence in our older, in our older lingo, right? Um, because most of the pro bono volunteers for us are not um, people of color, um, very few speakers of Spanish. So we try our best to um, bring some light and understanding to serving uh, with cultural humility. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lillian. Mary Lou? Sure. Good morning. Hi, my name is Mary Lou Bielek. I am the I have the privilege of being the dean of CUNY Law School. Uh, how do pro bono and um, diversity intersect in my institution? When it was founded in 1983, it was founded with a singular mission. It's a dual mission. First half of the mission is to create diversity in the profession and access to legal education. And the second aspect of the mission is to um, create competent, ethical, compassionate, creative public interest lawyers. And so as you see, the intersection uh, is baked into the law school's mission. I'm proud to tell you that um, CUNY Law School graduates a higher percentage of students going into public interest jobs than any other law school in the country. And that we are the most, uh, we have the most diverse faculty and the most diverse student body in the country. Um, dealing with the intersection between these two issues is baked into who we are, into what our curriculum is, 
into how we take care to train for diversity and to learn how to speak to each other and speak across cultural boundaries. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mary Lou. Kim, Kim Cooper-Smith, you're next. Good morning, everybody. I am very uh, privileged to be able to join this panel. So I am um, the chair of Aiken Gump, and I have been in that role for the last eight years. I suspect I am only, I am probably the only law firm chair of an AMLA 100 law firm who went to law school to be a public interest lawyer and has considered the last, I guess, 40 years now to be a, a detour from when I should really start the job that I wanted to start. And because I have been on this path um, in a way that was not what I originally intended, I have really tried to focus everything I can do in the privileged role that I have to bring the voice of diversity and the voice of pro bono to the large law firm sector. And um, I have worked to do that through, I would say, two main messages. One is using my voice at my firm on the issues of diversity and on the issues of support for pro bono. And it's also to make sure that I'm connected in, um, in understanding the core issues so that I am educating myself. Um, in that respect, I'm on the board of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, something that in, in the current environment is um, all the more at the forefront of, of uh, my focus right now. I'm on the board of Her Justice, which is a New York organization fighting um, for women in underserved communities. And I'm on the board of Equal Justice Works, which ties in very well to one of the themes of this, of this session, which is making sure that lawyers who want to do public interest work when they graduate have a path to do so. I, I frequently tell David Stern that if I had known about him in 1983, I think my path would have been very different. So I try to make sure that I use the position that I have on two issues that I feel deeply passionate about. I'm on the board of LCLD to make sure that law firm leaders and uh, the general counsel community are focused and that we're bringing the best, best possible way to uh, approach diversity effectively from a client point of view, which I think is crucial. And um, I, I will continue to, to fight these fights as long as I am given this, this platform to do so. Wonderful, thank you. Roger? Good morning. Um, I'm speaking today in my capacity as the immediate past president of the New York City Bar Association. Uh, the City Bar has over 24,000 members and has been in existence for 150 years. Uh, it is dedicated to the promotion of the reform of law, access to justice, and upholding the rule of law. And it does much of this work through its over 150 committees. Uh, but the City Bar also has the City Bar Justice Center, which uh, is one of the programs within the City Bar's sister uh, 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 City Bar Fund, uh, and that that, that the City Bar Justice Center is dedicated to uh, promoting access to justice for indigent persons, primarily through the use of pro bono services uh, that is coordinated by the staff of the Justice Center. The City Bar also has the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which is dedicated to promoting diversity within the profession. But it does so in coordination with many of the city bars committees that focus exactly on the question of diversity. But any time the city bar speaks, it speaks after having given all committee members the opportunity to weigh in on a particular issue. So if the city bar is making a statement with respect to access to justice, it is informed by the uh, diversity committees and uh, the programs that focus on those issues. As an example, uh, we had uh, we, we were originally scheduled to speak in March. Just before our, uh, our date, the City Bar sponsored a CLE that was dedicated to training persons who were going to be providing pro bono services on the needs to be uh, aware and conscious of the uh, many issues that affect the 
communities that they are going to be serving in terms of pro bono services, as has now been incredibly uh, impressed on all of us through recent events. So the city bar has, within its structure, always looked to make sure that anything it does is informed by issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Roger. And Tom? Yes, I'm quite honored to be on such a distinguished panel with people who represent organizations that are doing such tremendous work and to, especially a, a panel also moderated uh, by someone I respect as much as Paula. Um, I think it's a real honor for Thompson Reuters to have this opportunity to express our support of both of these critical issues, diversity, inclusion, and pro bono. Uh, access to justice and transparency are the guiding principles of what we are committed to as a corporation. We operate a foundation to highlight human rights issues and to promote transparency and media freedom. And we also operate a global pro bono network connecting lawyers uh, with people who need their services in 175 different countries. And on a personal note, I would say for me, it's been you know both um, humbling and surreal what's been going on. As someone who came to this country as an immigrant, um, sponsored by an African-American church in Dallas, Texas, and growing up in the Deep South, my ideas about why I wanted to go into law and what the law meant for our society and the issues that we, I think, all endeavor to try to improve all of us who are on this call. Um, I didn't know and I didn't think that I would live to see the day that these issues would be so conflated. Um, certainly, it's troubling for all of us, but I think it also presents a tremendous opportunity for us to realize that these issues are connected and that we have to stand together to address a wide variety of social injustices and inequity in our society um, for everyone. Thank you. So very well said, Tom. This this time in which we are all now um, navigating uh, to the best that we can um, has really highlighted some of the things that you all sa have said. The need to um, own and use your voice, as Kim said. Uh, the need to collaborate and train and educate, as both Lillian and Mary Lou and Roger elevated. And the need for transparency um, and commitment and thinking about um, what your individual and collective and organizational why is as to why you come to these issues and 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 lead right and to um, inspire others to take the mantle and and move on uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion and with pro bono especially especially now um, so I want to move on to get a little more uh, deep into um, a, a question that we have which is distinct issues specifically. What are some of the issues in pro bono and uh, distinct issues within diversity that need to be addressed? And I'm going to ask Lillian to um, to respond first, and then we'll ask Roger to uh, to take this question. Lillian, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Now okay. you can hear me. Yes. Okay. So um, I think that uh, diversity issues present for staff attorneys and um, pro bono volunteers uh, an opportunity to learn a lawyering skill, right? To communicate across cultures and to represent well um, and effectively, you really need cultural humility and openness to other cultures, to cultures that are different from our own. Our jobs as lawyers are really to explain what might seem inexplicable to a judge um, because uh, there's just a very narrow space where the lawyer, the client, and the judge overlap and have that opportunity to understand. And that's what I think we begin to teach when we say to lawyers, whether they're staff attorneys or pro bono attorneys, understand other cultures, operate from peer, uh, positions of respect, um, the need for very good communication and communication where you actively work at it is just essential. Again, I earlier said so many of our pro bono volunteers are of a different race and a different class from our clients, many of whom are people of color who have been ravaged by COVID-19 and by the recent 
hate murders of African Americans. And that is what we try to make sure staff attorneys and pro bono attorneys understand and bring to their representation of diverse clients. I think people can learn to do it. It's a skill. Look, I agree with you. I just want to follow up really quick with a, a, a question um, piggybacking on what you just, you just said. So in terms of how do you onboard people to say, look, you're going to be providing services to these, um, these pro bono clients who are in need, who are different from you. What is the conversation in terms of saying this is important? Like we can't just come in and, and decide that we're going to save the world without understanding and having that humility you just discussed. So when you're a staff attorney at Legal Aid, uh, cultural humility is part of your orientation with me. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. We're good. Okay. Um, when you're a staff attorney, it's part of your orientation. When we recruit you as a pro bono volunteer, we bring you in, we do a training, and cultural humility or competence understanding what's happening to our clients is really part of those substantive trainings as well. So that's how we onboard a pro bono volunteer. Um, so that, I'd say that's what I'd say in a nutshell. It's part of the introduction to doing the work, whether you're a staff attorney or a pro bono volunteer. Thank you, Leah. I think it, it's to your point, it's so important for that to be a part of the DNA of the organization and, and to how you onboard in order to prioritize and, and make people understand how important it is. So thank you so much. Roger. Sure. Um, <clears throat> many of the uh, pro bono volunteers that work in coordination with the City Bar Association indeed come from large firms who have as individuals and as part of their organizations, very limited contact, prior contact, with uh, persons from the communities of color and from the disadvantaged communities that are being served by these pro bono volunteers. Uh, but for the coordination that is effectuated by the staff of the uh, City Bar Justice Center in, together with assistance from the many committees, it would be a, a difficult transition for some of these attorneys to be able to both understand not just issues in, uh, with respect to diversity and inclusion, but actually the legal issues themselves that they are seeking to assist these persons on. It, you know, a, the normal uh, pro bono volunteer has not been subject to an eviction proceeding. The normal pro bono volunteer has, didn't have to worry about how to get into this country and stay within the country. So the training that is provided by the City Bar Association, it usually uh, not just through staff, but in coordination with legal services providers, such as the one that Lillian works for, serves to uh, accomplish two main purposes. One, help them do a better job in terms of understanding the law that they are going to be assisting the uh, client with, but equally important to understand where the client is coming from and to be able to communicate with the client in a way that is designed to ensure that the client feels comfortable with imparting information because you can't help someone if they don't talk to you. And two, understands what it is that the pro bono attorney is seeking to accomplish. And for that, you have to have a dialogue and be able to speak uh, freely and openly, however, with sensitivity towards where the other person is coming from. And I think the City Bar Association has been very effective in being able to recruit, train, and uh, engage pro bono volunteers to provide this sort of assistance. Thank you for, for that um, sort of foundation in terms of how, how this all happens. I think it's so important to both use the momentum of volunteerism, right? You want to have people, you want to have as many people as possible providing uh, pro bono support because the need is there and it'll continue to be there. Um, but thinking about that at, at that intersection of wanting to also um, uh, uh, manage privilege and how it comes across and, and also um, sort of not have the clients, the pro bono clients be subjected to another harm in terms of being faced with this sort of maybe um, white savior um, that, that might come to, to them in terms of that pro bono. So having that humility and cultural understanding 
is so important to say that everyone you're talking to is, you know, a person and deserves respect and understanding and starting there will help you to be a better lawyer. And I can say as a proud member of the city bar, that is exactly what is, is, um, is promoted and encouraged uh, when you come in to, to do and, and talk about pro bono. So thank you for that, Roger uh, and Lillian. And I wanna just remind all of the uh, participants who are watching, if you have any questions, you can use the participant buttons to uh, submit any questions you have, and they will uh, get those questions over to me in order to ask the panel. Um, if you have a specific panelist who you'd like to ask a question to, please indicate that as well, and I will make sure that that happens. Or if it's general, I'll happy, I'm happy to answer the or ask the old panel. Before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to give the opportunity for any of the other panelists. If you had anything else you'd like to share at this time um, regarding the first question, I'm seeing no's. I'm seeing no. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question um, where we're going to start. This is going to you, Mary Lou. Um, from your standpoint, what are the disparities in the population served and serving both in pro bono and diversity and inclusion efforts? And where are their similarities? Uh, thanks, Paula. Uh, very quickly, like ju just to really paint the picture, 64% um, of lawyers are men, but 70% of clients of legal services are women. Um, we've got 13% of lawyers are non-white, non-Hispanic, uh, but 6.6 .6 of the equity partners in the United States and the big firms are racial or ethnic minorities. 10% of lawyers are African-American or Hispanic, and 46% of clients are African-American or Hispanic. Um, stepping back a little bit, focusing in on one area, what's the difference between being a black teen and a white teen? The black teen is four times more likely to be arrested. What's the difference between being a child in a white family and a child in a family of color? The children in the family of color are twice as likely to be hung hungry. What's the difference between a white man and a black man? The black man is twice as likely to be without a job. What's the difference between being white and black in America? When a pandemic hits, you are twice as likely to die if you are black. And what is the difference between being black and white in America? If you are black, you are twice as likely to be living in poverty. The clients that are served by legal services, a one person household has an income of $15,000. A four person household has an income of $32,000, but the median pay for lawyers in the United States was $120,000. So across gender, across race, and across economic status, there are huge divides. Lawyers, of course, 100% of us have high school educations, 100% of us have college educations, and 100% of us have JDs. Most American adults with families with incomes below 125% of the federal poverty line do not have a college education. 88% of low-income adults do not have a college degree, including 62% who have no more than a high school education. So across education, there is a deep divide. What about privilege? Here's just a couple of questions to think about. Did you feel safe on the way to school every day? Did you feel safe at school? Did you have a quiet place to study? Were you hungry during school? What about showing up on time? Can you afford a babysitter? Can you afford a reliable babysitter? Can you afford an Uber, a taxi? Is there a taxi or an Uber in your neighborhood? When there's an announcement in the subway and you can hear it, is it in your language? Can you afford the subway. Um, you know, for me, that that question um, sums up with is now finally the moment that whites in this country can stop pretending that not having a criminal record or having enough food or a job is the result of achievement or merit or worth. The divide is huge. And the work that people who do legal services with poor people do is work in a field that we don't live in. The Persian poet Rooney said, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. We need to understand that we as lawyers occupy a different field and have different lived experiences of different fields. Uh, the work that this summit set out to do is so necessary. I, I'm having, Having demonstrated the divide, three quick things. One is I urge you all in, 
who are in firms to survey uh, your pro bono lawyers to find out why they are doing the work they did. As Lillian said, understanding that is the first thing you need to understand to understand what training you need to do. The second is to institutionally and profoundly and deeply connect with people who do this work every day and who are the experts. And what I mean by that is not only work closely with them, but help provide the funding for them to do the work they need to do to give your pro bono lawyers uh, the education, cultural and legal, that they need to do the work well. And then finally, if you're not all at despair, um, the, the place where I go is that, you know, a really good lawyer, whether they're doing pro bono work or whether they're doing paid work, is someone who approaches their client and the work with humility, with a very open mind and open ears in a non-judgmental way. Um, and all of you have lawyers in your firms who can do that. Mayla, thank you so much for that sobering uh, outlay of um, of stats and relaying of, of what where we are in this country. I mean, everything you said is is essentially a, a exclamation point on on institutional and systemic racism uh, in this country, right? And and so when you think about what diversity, equity, and inclusion, and prioritizing education around those areas, as well as doing pro bono, makes sense. I mean, exactly what you said is that, right? Without understanding why people have gotten to this point and why they might need pro bono assistance, you are really unable, I think, to do it properly, right? To serve the, the folks who need your help properly. So thank you so much for that. Kim, Kim Cooper Smith, I'd love for you to answer this. I don't want to ever go after Mary Lou again. <laughs> Put that in my file, please. Um, so that is a daunting and overwhelming answer. And um, I think brings up the sheer inadequacy of the legal community to address the issues that are so pervasive. In order for me to feel that there is a level of um, way that we in the large law firm community community can um, assist is to take all of that information and then channel it in the way that we can. And the way that we can is to take the lawyers and it is a diverse range of lawyers who want to do pro bono work and to do as you said, really as everybody said to put them in a position where they can work with strong organizations, we can support the organizations, we can know that the training on cultural humility, on the actual legal skills, because as someone pointed out, not, not everybody that's doing pro bono has ever been involved in the kind of work and issues that, that are extant in the pro bono community, and make sure that we're putting our lawyers in places where they can succeed. And we, I think, have had, uh, you know, we, we, we had brought someone in as a pro bono partner, Steve Schulman, a long time ago, actually, right when I was becoming chair. I said that I thought this was its, its own, it needed a partnership role in order for it to have the gravitas that it needed. And that's, I think, the second part of my message, which goes back to um, communication of the gravitas of the issues that we are prioritizing. So for us, pro bono is a huge, huge part of our culture. It goes back to Bob Strauss. And we literally have an award ceremony every year. The firm's done over 100,000 hours of pro bono work. It, it's viewed as something that is a big benefit to you. So, so Paul, I know when we were preparing for this, part of the question is, are, are the people who are doing pro bono marginalized in some way at the firm? Are people in some way stigmatized if they're doing pro bono? And I think that's a real question because I think in some places that is the case to be candid. We try and make sure that that's not the case. Um, all the hours count as if you, whatever work you are doing, we view pro bono as, as relevant. I mean, we call it anti-bono and pro bono. That was Steve Shulman's term. Um, and make sure that we are um, allowing everyone who wants to do this work to do it and to feel supported in doing it. I think the other part of the message is, again, the platform that I have. So, you know, it was with some reluctance, I have to say, I just took on a, a VAWA petition. Um, I was on a call yesterday 
way, I think it was very important for me to be able to say to others at this crucial time, make the time to do this. But you know, this is not my proficiency at this point. It was a while ago, but um, the but I weighed the message that I sent, which I sent to the New York office when they said they were looking for partner volunteers. I am doing one of these cases. That means two things. I'm making the time commitment, and I'm also humble enough to say I'm going to need help from people who have done many other um, forms of VAWA and other petitions, and you can have that experience too. So what I'm trying to do in a, in a very different environment than, than um, the, the incredible organizations that are um, represented here today is within the law firm community, create the ways in which um, everyone can do this kind of work. We also, you know, we have pro bono scholars program. Um, we have the Strauss diversity and inclusion scholars program. Because that last issue of is it a privilege to be able to do pro bono work? Is it a privilege to be able to work at a public interest organization? We're trying to address that with just the financial support, equal justice works um, fellowships, finding ways for people who have this in their heart, which you can tell um, I have fallen in that category, to be able to not have economics be the reason that they don't go down their chosen path. Thank you so much for 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 um, outlining that in terms of your clear passion around around this. You know, one of the things when we, we had our prep call, we talked about was when you're thinking about just the sort of inner workings of the law firm. Um, and I, I can kind of ask you to mute your um, mic until I get back to you on this question. I want to just make I'm hearing feedback. Thank you. Um, so, okay. There you go. Um, one of the issues is you can be within a firm and be diverse, you know, you know women being a person of color um, and want to do pro bono. Um, and it may have in some firms the effect of it being a challenge because people are not prioritizing pro bono and, and equating it in terms of the work product. So you've already sort of managed that piece. And there's the flip side of the benefit of being able to gain skills right that you may not have in terms of um options for the actual work you're doing um if if you know be a pro bono so there are a lot of different layers of this for um diverse and other attorneys within a law firm speaking from the pro bono and diversity intersection and i think it's so powerful for to have someone who is leading the organization leading the firm to say i'm doing this you should be doing this and if you're doing this it is not going to um to hurt you it is going to benefit you. So, I totally agree, and that was the message. And actually, the associate that has the most amount of experience and is leading the project that I'm on is a woman of color, um, and she knows way more than everybody else on the team. And it is a great opportunity for her. I, you know, I I get that I have, you know, my children remind me like, mom, everybody is nice to you, but they don't really mean it. Um, I, I, I like to think that I can constructively um, use my, my role to model behavior that I think is desirable. And I will keep doing that as long as I'm in this role. That's essentially a leadership manifesto, right? <laughs> that, that is leadership in a nutshell, right? Use your behavior to model for others. Um, I've been given a couple of, of things that I need to do right now. So I need to remind all of the attendees that they should be engaging on social media. We are currently trending. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we want you to use the hashtag. The hashtag is a little bit of a long one, so I'm going to say it twice. It's hashtag VOLS, V-O-L-S, pro bono D-E-I. Hashtag VOLS, pro bono D-E-I. So if you're talking about it now on social medias, and we encourage you to use that both in Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and say that you're what you're, you know, you're learning, um, who's participating. The great way that we as individuals can promote um, something that's important to us, whether we're participating or 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 learning, is to use social media. That's why it's so powerful, and especially now, um, we need to use our voices in all the ways that we can. The other reminder that I have to tell all of you is that you can access the program materials by clicking on the supplements tab below the video image. So if you're looking for the materials that will supplement the the, um, the CLE for this session, it can be found in the supplements tab uh, below the video image. And I want to again thank you. There are a few questions that have come in, um, and 
and Roger has asked to answer to answer one of the questions. So I'm going to ask the question and I'll answer to you, Roger. What do you what do you do when a volunteer falls short and doesn't demonstrate cultural humility? How do you manage the situation in real time and after? The legal profession is one that is infamous for not being great at submitting feedback. How can we provide feedback to volunteers in real time? And Roger? Um, I'd like to give as an example the recent initiative that the City Bar uh, Justice Center began uh, after COVID-19, the Small Business Initiative. This is an initiative for which over 500 lawyers have signed up to provide pro bono assistance to small businesses in accessing uh, whatever uh, loans, grants, other uh, support is available through the federal government and also through state and local programs. We provide training, but in terms of the feedback, we do two things. And I know this uh, one based on my partner who actually was one of the volunteers for uh, this uh, small business initiative. After having provided the uh, service to the client, my partner was given the opportunity to give feedback to the city bar on his experience in terms of how he felt he was able to provide assistance, which is important for the city bar to be able to gauge how do we make sure that we can continue to get pro bono volunteers to enjoy their experience. But equally, if not more importantly, the city bar also contacts the clients and discusses with the clients their experience and their impression of whether the assistance was helpful, whether it is something that they uh, found valuable. And the two put together, the combination of reaching out to the client and reaching out to the provider better informs how we structure our pro bono assistance going forward. It doesn't answer that part of the question about how do you fix it in real time. That is one that absent a supervisor who is working with you directly on the case, it's very difficult to do. I do know though that the city bar requires for each pro bono matter that there be a partner in charge of the provision of service so that there is ultimately someone within the firm the pro bono, uh, that is providing the pro bono assistance who is ultimately responsible to, to make sure that the service is appropriate and what is needed. Mary Lou? So, so the I, uh, idea of feedback is one that firms struggle with with their paid clients as well, right? It, it's a hard thing to do to know how to give feedback and it's hard to make the time to give feedback. There's this extra layer in the pro bono cases where like the question is, is there someone from the firm who's close enough to know that the error has been made? You know, that the, that the lawyer, young lawyer has been culturally insensitive. There would be if it was a, uh, an interview with a client on a paying matter. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's a really great question because it makes me think about something that I haven't thought a lot about before. Um, and, and certainly then the step back, one more layer of complication, I guess that's my thing today, how hard it is. Um, the partner has to get that the associate acted in a culturally insensitive way, right? Um, so there's some, there's fertile work to be done, I think. S certainly, and 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 oh, Lillian, I see you've gone off mute. I was just going to shamefully report that when a pro bono lawyer fails in any way, and we understand that to be the case, we stop using them, we stop referring to them. And if it was someone very egregious, I think I can imagine being tasked. Me, I would be tasked with the conversation. But I know that's perhaps not what the questioner wanted to hear. But in my small solo firm way world, that's how I would like not deal with it. Deal with it, right? I'm sh I'm sh I'm ashamed to report that to you, but that's reality for me. Thanks, Elena. I don't think you should be ashamed at all. I I think that's the right answer. I mean, I think attempting to work with someone who has not done what they should, I, I, you know, that's what we would do with a paying client. Um, I, I agree that there are instances where um, a conversation would work, but I think it's also a pretty big indication that this isn't right. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that answer. Thank you. Can, so I'm gonna, can uh, everyone go, there you go, perfect. So um, I wanna just 
in my consultant capacity say that lawyers in general are really bad at feedback. So, right, and so, and so, and they're very bad at feedback, particularly when their biases are triggered. And our biases tend to be triggered when we are called out on the things that, that represent, you know, uh, sort of that we have experienced or, or shown bias. And so, to that end, you know, I think that one of the things that maybe we should talk about in some of the subsequent sessions are about feedback and how to appropriately give that, right, in, in real time. And, and some of the work that needs to be done at this intersection is um, hearing some of the experiences. And I know a lot of pro bono organizations will, will give feedback forms to the clients so that they can anonymously submit what the, their, um, their experiences have been and to use those in subsequent trainings to foster cultural humility, to say, these are the things that we are not going to allow here and here's why and here's what happened and, and this is what we need to do better at. So Tom, I wanna give you a very easy question. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, when we started talking about this, COVID-19 um, had not occurred yet. When we started talking about the fact that we're not in the middle of um, what is now an uprising um, in this country uh, against um, racial um, uh, injustice and the killings of the police, et cetera, or, or police killings of Black people. So my question to you is, talk about the disparate impact that these situations have had on community of color and low-income individuals as well as current events and, and talk about how Thompson Reuters and you and your company have responded to this. It's uh, certainly not an easy question, um, but uh, I uh, I welcome the opportunity to address it because I think it's so, so important. A lot of the issues that we've been talking about, racism, um, you know, language barriers, poverty, all of these things existed before the coronavirus pandemic started. What it has done is it's brought into sharp focus things that maybe we conveniently ignored um, and in certain places has really highlighted the disparities in our society. If you take, for example, New York City, uh, where I know a number of us who are on this panel live, you really do see this, you know, in, in so many ways, uh, spanning from the disparity in the ability to access quality health care between the rich and the poor. Um, and then you look at even the question of choice and how to shelter. You know, for wealthy people, they may have a choice of actually leaving places like New York City. Um, there's been some media coverage recently of the kinds of places where they have gone. But for many people, they do not have a choice. And if we look at access to transportation, uh, you know, there are those people who are required to take public transportation because they are essential workers. And if we look at essential workers, you know, we talk a lot about those in the medical front lines, and, and certainly there is a great story to tell there of racial diversity within that staff as well. Um, but if we also look at the broader spectrum of who feeds us, who brings us the food that keeps us alive, who keeps the subways running, who runs the buses, who cleans the streets, now, these are people who are just as essential, and they are overwhelmingly people of color, uh, people of immigrant status, um, and then we also think about the crisis within, you know, for women in that this crisis that this crisis has really been disproportionately um, hard on them. There has been assumptions around who will take help, take care of health care uh, for the family, who will uh, sort of be responsible for education in this remote learning environment. There's just so many things that we can look at to see these are problems that existed before and they have been amplified. So now we have this real sort of microscopic effect that we can sort of look at through this lens and see all these disparities. And now we have a choice. And there are a lot of people who are currently today, right now saying, you know, it is no longer something that we can allow to be silent on. We have to speak up. Today is the funeral for George Floyd. Uh, I think there can be, you know, um, no other point in, you know, recent modern history to me it appears where so many of these critical issues have been highlighted and brought to the forefront. How we choose to deal with it is still in question. And I don't certainly, I would never pretend to have any answers. I think these are very hard questions to say. I think we as lawyers play an important role in what we can do to help the underrepresented and underprivileged uh, parts of our society. I think people like Kim who are leading on the big law front are amazing and make a big impact. I think, you know, the you know, people like Mary Lou who are educating people to make a difference in the world, people like Lillian um, and Roger who are training folks to get out there and make a difference, and people like you, Paula, 
who as an individual leader in our legal society set an example, I think these are all the different ways that we as lawyers have an incredible opportunity that not all members of our society have to make a difference. You know, how we choose to do it is, is up to us. But, you know, I'm very uh, hopeful that we can take this opportunity to really try to speak up and to stand together across not just one issue, but many issues and realize that we need to stand together to make progress on all these issues. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that was such a, a wonderful exclamation point to all of the things that we have been um, uh, talking about. I wanted to just to ask a little bit more of a, a detailed question specifically about how the, the you know, Thompson Reuters' capacity as someone who provides data and, and information. Um, is there anything that's happening right now um, within your organization that's specific to that for, you know, either diversity pro bono or specifically highlighting what's happening with COVID? Well, thanks so much for following up. Uh, we're really reminding I didn't answer the question entirely. So thanks, Paula. You're very kind. Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to share that a couple of things. One, you're absolutely right. You know, from the beginning, because of our unique position and being provider of legal software and content, as well as having a news organization, we've been trying to make information with regard, to, uh, with regard to the coronavirus uh, pandemic readily accessible, and also to make accessible information that people need to file for loans and to file for assistance. We've also been reaching out to make sure that law students have access uh, to the legal tools that they need to deliver the work that they can in their volunteer capacity. As an employer, and I'm sure um, you know Kim can talk about what they're doing within the law firm sector, but as a, as a corporation, uh, we just recently doubled the amount of volunteer days that um, employees can take. You know, we up until uh, just this week, we had been giving people two days of volunteer time. In addition, on top of that, we also give 20 at we encourage all of our lawyers to take 20 hours of I don't want to say billable time, but 20 hours of work time for pro bono. Um, and so, you know, in reaction to what's going on and in particular, it's hit us very hard since Minneapolis is one of our um, key centers, we've doubled that. So now we are giving people four days of volunteer work off. And that is, again, separate to the pro bono work that people do. And we do have a large number of employees that are lawyers, not just the people in the legal department, but people also who uh, produce the content. Um, just this morning or just yesterday, we announced that we are donating a million dollars um, to help build rebuild uh, Minneapolis. And I think we continue to try to think about how we can make sure that accurate information data and facts are available there's just so much misinformation going on right now and one of the biggest tools that we have to fight for justice is to make sure that the right information and the objective truth is available and known and so that's part of our mission as well and i, I would just close by saying also i'm also very conscious of what's happening with the press in america during this time you know we had three reporters who were assaulted over the last seven days in, in covering the different protests. Um, and so I think our ability to cover the news and bring that information to the public is also incredibly important. Thank you for that supplement, Tom. That was very, really, um, really helpful. Lillian, can you talk about how COVID-19 and the recent issues um, have affected the way that you provide legal services with your organization? Well, I can, I can. Organizationally, we were not prepared to all be working remotely and pretty quickly. And I literally on a dime, I'd say we we got everyone at 100 percent remote work. People put their cell phones into use so that call, they could take calls. And eventually we got the support staff all fully hooked up. Um, we are monitoring the impact of COVID on clients. We're totally, I'd say from about April 2nd, 45 percent of our cases are related to COVID in some way either because someone in the household has had COVID or because the legal rights and remedies are impacted by COVID-19. In some areas though, it is much higher. So just food in the area of supplemental nutrition assistance program, food stamps, 75% of our intakes in the last few weeks have been related to COVID. So we see very clearly the impact on our clients we developed a whole set of legal lifelines. And, I, you know, Tom, we could talk about, you know, if Thompson Reuters wants to adopt our legal lifelines um, for great content for lay people about COVID-19 remedies here in New York. And that's how we're trying to respond directly. We are trying to figure out how you do outreach in a virtual way. 
We've run town halls on Facebook, having hundreds of people dial in to hear about COVID-19 and food, COVID-19 and being safe at home, COVID-19 and money. And so great topics, I think, very responsive to the needs that our clients are facing. Thank you, Lillian. Sure. Roger? Yes. Um, I, can we, oh, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to uh, get back to where we began in terms of the intersection between pro bono and diversity efforts. Uh, the City Bar Association has actually recommended in a public statement to law firms uh, throughout the city that they give equal weight in terms of credit to uh, volunteer work done by their associates on uh, efforts to promote diversity as they do for pro bono. Because you know, pro bono obviously is key to being able to promote access to justice. But uh, in to get at everything that we've been talking about this morning, you really do need a diverse profession and you need a diverse judiciary that reflects the persons who appear before the court in terms of you know, their ethnicity and all of the other issues in terms of background. And if law firms don't have uh, a, a policy of getting their uh, attorneys involved in promoting diversity, it's going to be very difficult for the firms in particular and the profession in general to become as diverse as, as it must. And this is not just a, a, an effort for the next year or so. This just must be the way we do things going forward, period. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Roger. I think it's an important, an important point uh, because oftentimes um, the you know, particularly um, diverse attorneys taking on the additional weight can affect their trajectory within the firms if they're not given those, that, that type of credit as well. Uh, to that end, I think it's a perfect segue for me to ask him um, you know, how COVID-19 has affected the, the work that you do and maybe um, to actually there's a question that did come in um, then I'll also layer for you. It's is does Aiken have a number of pro bono hours they want attorneys to reach as well? Okay, so um, a couple of things in there. Just starting going back um, to to the last comments, um, we we did come to the conclusion. I mean, we we have a holistic system for acknowledging everyone's contribution. We have always had an unlimited number of pro bono hours that that people can do. We did last year create another category of work that would be considered to be the equivalent of billable work, which is work focused on um, DNI. There were a couple of reasons for that, in part because we wanted to respond to what um, we were hearing in the community. But also, I think one of the key things to think about in this, um, I think, Paul, it was where you were headed in the, in the end of your question, which is, it, it's not the burden on the diverse lawyers to create diversity in the law firm. Um, and it, it's in a way a message that I learned in, in my own path, um, gesturing towards my daughters. So 33 years ago, um, so as one of the few partners in the firm at the time who was a woman with young children, I remember when we started a mentorship program and we said, you know, please tell us who you would like to mentor. It was not my charm. It was the fact that I was really the only person that anybody saw that like had had children and stayed in a large law firm. Like 17 women signed up to have me be their mentor. Like that's not a sustainable answer, right? That's not a method that works. And fast forward to being in a leadership position and expecting that the diverse attorneys are supposed to recruit diverse attorneys. They're supposed to make everyone feel that inclusiveness matters. Like. That, that needs to change. Um, and one of the things we did, and I, you know, I, I feel like we have so far to go, but we, one of the things we recently did was to radically change our diversity and inclusion um, leadership, which I am now the chair of that committee. And instead of being regional and focused purely on um, the, the each market and what kinds of activities we're doing in each market, we went to an approach where it's um, largely firm leadership. It's practice group leaders, it's office leaders of significant offices. It is people who are passionate about this subject, but it's not expecting the diverse attorneys to present to us, here's what you should do. It's about the people who are able to affect other people's opinions, shaping what the message is and what we wanna do. Um, you know, that included hiring our own chief diversity and inclusion officer, 
at a chief level so that there is not a question about where he is in the hierarchy. He reports directly to me. And I mean, really, I, I feel like we have barely scratched the surface. Our numbers are not any better than, than what Mary Lou talked about before, um, but we're getting there and we're focused on it and I'm not giving up, I guess. <laughs> That's exactly what we all want to hear. And so I wanted to just let everyone who was on the, the line know that we are, are, are committed to staying on till 11.15 to do Q&A. Um, so I know that this is something that a lot of people are very passionate about, and I'm glad that there are questions coming in. I want to just to, to say that, you know, so Kim, in my, in my capacity as a diversity consultant, I have had a lot of people reach out to me recently because of what's happening. And there are a couple of, of, of things that the firms are doing at this intersection of being responsive to their, their black and diverse associates um, and pro bono, right? So one of them is if you are arrested in, pe in a peaceful um, protest, it's not going to affect your trajectory within this organization. Number two is if you want to represent folks who are um, who have been arrested, right? In in this, like, then then we encourage that. We want you to go out and use something that you're passionate about. And I think that that honors who they are, responds to what their want and need is, as well as saying that. So it's not just you work here. It's also we hear you, and that's very important for the diversity and inclusion intersection. Totally agree. And we're working to um, find the ways not just to communicate that message, because I, I do think at our firm, people would feel that it is completely within the realm for them to protest. And for, I mean, we have a lot of people asking, what can I do? And what are the pro bono opportunities? What organizations, whether it's Vols or others in other city, like, how can we get involved? So. My mission is to channel all of that into action. Um, I think I'm driving our pro bono partner crazy with my emails all day and night about where are we, which organizations can we have the most impact with, um, how can we meet the, the needs of the communities that we're in. But I completely agree with you that this is a time to embrace that kind of work. I realize I didn't answer part of your question, um, we, I think we have about 850 lawyers, 791, I, I learned this morning, um, have done some pro bono. So it is, we, we are, um, it is something that everybody feels comfortable doing. So at this moment in time, we're fortunate to have that as the culture that people are operating in. Thanks so much, Kim. Mary Lou, can you talk about how COVID-19, uh, this layer of what has happened recently, um, how that has affected uh, CUNY Law School, which I have to give a shout out as an alumni, um, and, and anything else you'd like to add at this time? Great. Um, thanks, Paula. I, I guess I want to pick up on your last question first. And, and first, I, and even before that, I want to say that I am re incredibly inspired by Kim's work in this area. Um, it's one thing for me to live this, but that my institution lives this. And for her to be trying to lead her culture in this way, in such a, de a determined um, and disciplined way is, is really inspiring. Um, but the second thing I wanted to say on the intersection between pro bono and diversity at this moment is, I have never before um, experienced so many of my colleagues of color and my staff of color and my students of color telling me that at this moment they are incapacitated. That they are enraged. Every black mother is terrified for her children. Not that she wasn't yesterday, but she is today. It's in her face all day long. Um, and the leadership in the country makes it feel like it's impossible that it's going to be get better for their children. But, but the point I want to make is that, you know, like I work with people who care deeply about this and with students who care deeply about this stuff. This moment in the country is profoundly different. So I think Kim's point about not relying on our diverse, <laughs> our non-white colleagues at this moment is especially true and magnified. Um, and, you know, I think there's also real work that institutions have to do to tell people that they know that's how they feel. That walking into a meeting where everybody's pretending like, like 
of course, we we're just going to go about our business is incredibly painful for them. And, and I, I say this not as an overly empathetic person, although sometimes I am, but, but I'm just saying this feels very different. The expressions of what I just told you from colleagues across the country um, who every day wear their skin not white and every day do this work, all of a sudden, it, it's totally different for them. So I, I just wanted to put that on the table because I, I think it's really important. And then, you know, it's magnified because in New York City, more of them are likely to have lost people. Um, my co my co colleagues on the faculty who are people who've earned JDs and who make more than $100,000 a year come from communities in this city. They come from Elmhurst, they come from Jackson Heights, they come from the Bronx, where many more people die. They are much more likely to have an, even if they live on the Upper East Side, to have an aunt or an uncle or a family member. So, um, so yes, you know, like we pivoted, I, the new word of the day, we pivoted on the dime and went remote um, and we're all learning how to use Zoom. Um, and we're finding that our students of color are much more likely not to have reliable internet or a quiet place um, to study. Um, you know, it's something to think about. I don't know if there's a parallel in the law firm world, but many law schools across the country went to pass fail for the spring when we all went remote, because what we realized was how, um, how much privilege is involved in being able to engage in the learning at home. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, it's not just a question of, um, of our being sensitive to racial disparities. It's like, what are the nuances of life? that are making it more complicated for not only our clients, which I think Lillian spoke about eloquently, but our colleagues. Thank you. Um, I thought I saw was someone else going to respond and say something that's okay. So there is, and thank you so much for, for saying that Mary Lou. I think it's the humanity piece that we have to remember, right? You know, I, last night my son came downstairs at 1130 and said, I can't sleep because there's helicopters right above our house in Brooklyn. And, and so, and he's a little black boy and I look at him and I'm like, what is going to be your experience, you know, in this world, given what we know, we know. And, and, and that's a hard, um, a hard weight to bear. Um, and, and yet then still in trying to navigate every single day. So there's a question that came in, I think is important. Um, is there a step that follows a cultural competency training for pro bono lawyers? Curious to learn about what panelists think about trainings being helpful slash impactful and their outcome. Um, Lillian, this sounds like it's something that will be kicked to you first. Um, and so. Uh, so yeah, I saw that question, Paula. I was kind of avoiding it because I have to say that um, I don't think we do the follow-up that's really needed. And that is really more possible in a staff situation where someone can chat me or email me quickly or come by, not so much come by right now, because, you know, not right now. So there's the opportunity for better follow-up, better feedback, better mentoring. But I think all we can do is make ourselves available to pro bono lawyers and say, when you have an interaction that isn't going well, when you check out, when you see your client is checking out, you know, take a moment and reflect about what happened and was it due to cultural difference and can it be repaired? Um, and I invite people to call me you know, and that doesn't happen that often. Um, so I do think being available really maybe is all we can do in the pro bono situation. I think if you're in a firm, you know, or you're the City Bar Justice Center, which is a very big and terrific organization, Roger, but uh, then maybe the opportunity for follow up is a little bit more realistic. But I think that's what's needed, right? Mentoring follow up. Agreed. Roger? Uh, one of the things that the city bar does do, and it's been doing it for years, is require that for all panel presentations, there be diversity on the panel. And we do that for several reasons. It's not just you know for show. 
the idea is if you've got a diverse panel, it is much more likely to present a diverse you know, series of issues to be discussed and understood. And I think that uh, when it comes to anything involving pro bono services, if you are hearing from persons who are training you, who come from diverse backgrounds, it's just going to increase the likelihood of the cultural sensitivity being part of the initial discussion, as opposed to just one of the check, check marks that you have to deal with. So uh, it is, in addition to the feedback, both from the client and from the attorneys, it's the initial training that is also designed from the outset to be uh, sensitive to, to diversity. I think you hit the nail on the head, Roger. One of, sometimes when I do trainings, particularly at law firms, I will say, when was the last time you had a black woman present to you as an expert? Raise your hand, not all at once, <laughs> right? Because it is true, it's who we look at as experts and, and, and how it shifts our bias because of what we are exposed to is so important. Um, and so there's a, one last, I think probably a last question that's come in, um, and it is this. Um, how can we educate, speak with, and win over the people, many of them white like me, well, not like me, but the, the question, person asking the question, who are on the cusp of making a change in their thinking and actions, but are afraid to say or do the wrong thing? Tom? Wow. Um, that is, that's a tough question, and I'm not sure I'm the best person qualified um, to answer that. Um, it's hard. You know, I, I think there's a lot of people, folks, myself included, who are well-intentioned and, and maybe we don't, we don't always understand as much as we think we do. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, and I think this is one of the things that we had before. I don't necessarily think it's up to diverse folks to have to accommodate someone if they get it wrong and then they're hurt. I, I, should you express it? I think you should. Um, so I don't know if there's anything we can do other than raise awareness. Uh, maybe that isn't the answer that the questioner wanted to hear. I think we should raise awareness. I think we should try the most that we can in the, our own individual ways. Maybe one thing that we can encourage people um, is that it is okay to not get it 100% right if we're making progress step by step. And even if any of us in our own ways on any particular issue maybe gets it slightly wrong or maybe if someone doesn't welcome us uh, for what we're trying to do, um, you know, these problems are so large and so many people are in need you know, the the aggregate goal that we're trying to achieve is still being sort of inched closer to day by day. So I can only say just uh, if people are willing, one, to be open minded as to who can help and what their intentions are, but then two, those who do help to be open minded as to sometimes we can get it wrong in terms of our lack of cultural sensitivity or, 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 other, or other things. That's a great question. I, I, if I had the answer, I'd be doing it. So I don't, I don't know. I'd love to hear the other. So, so uh, it looks like Kim has a, a response. Yeah, I, I just, um, I wanted to add similarly. Um, I, I think this is a really hard question. And um, in my eight years in this role, I think I have, um, I've learned, I, I think Marsha started out a bit more about listening. Um, as you can probably just tell in the last hour, I am a woman of action. So when, when they're when faced with this, to me, it was about how do I explain to people how they might look at things differently? And I think that has been impactful at, at I guess, the partner retreat two years ago. I stood up and said, I'm going to make all of you uncomfortable. And I talked about being one of very few women and walking into a room of the managing partners of 300 law firms and seeing a sea of Navy blazers. And even though I, I feel like I deserve to be in the room each year that I walk into the Navy blazer room, um, it feels uncomfortable to me. And for all of you who have never experienced that, um, you, you are missing a perspective. And um, we invited our practice group leaders to an event we had for all of the women attorneys from around the world in the firm. And there were 16 men with 350 women. And I stood up and said, welcome to our world, okay? This is what it feels like to be the only person at a table. This is what it feels like um, when everybody can see you because you look different than everybody else. Now picture a black associate in a large conference room where you think you've made him feel comfortable or you included her, 
that doesn't happen by the fact that they walk through the door. It has a lot to do with how you act. And that, I think, was one of the direct ways. In listening, I've learned that that I, I, that I have to find other ways too, because I'm not going to, as the, as the questioner rightly said, the people that know what is right and have their heart trying to get this better, they, they're already in this with me. The people that have um, more reluctance or, or less confidence about how to manage these issues, I think we have to find other approaches beyond the one that I have um, focused on, and I'm trying to find ways to have that message come across. Thank you. In Thank, you. Smaller Thank you so much, Kim. And, and I see you off of me earlier, but we're actually down at the end of time, so I'm going to ask everyone to be back on mute. Um, so before we kick it back to Marsha, I just wanted to, to follow up with that question to just say um, intent and impact are the two other things we should like. You can have great intentions and have wrong impact. It is incumbent upon people who are trying to learn to do so. But the biggest skill set here is to be able to apologize when you have done wrong, right? To say, I own that I've done wrong and I'm going to try to do better. That's what um, is, is missing. Like people who, who are shown that they're done wrong and they tend to shy away or, or you know, lash out, that's what we have to change because we have to all know that we don't know everything and that we can get better at this. And with that being said, I would like to thank all of you for your time and your, your thoughts and kick it back over to Marsha to close us out. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everybody. That was an amazing, amazing panel. I so appreciate it. And I just want to end with this thought. I might have started with two ears and one mouth and about listening, but I'm going to end with the expression silence equals death. And we've seen that because silence has literally meant death from COVID-19. It's meant death at the hands of police brutality, and it's going to mean death if the protests are treated in the way they've been treated. So I want to say this, let's keep communicating. We have another panel coming up on June 11th. We're going to now break it down and make it interactive. We're actually going to break it into groups to discuss these issues. So that's number one. Number two, we started this conversation talking about integrating the pro bono and diversity efforts in organizations, in firms, in companies, in law schools. Please, let's talk to each other because otherwise silence equals death. And I want to talk about pro bono for a minute and just say, Everything we're doing, running a legal service organization, my colleagues have been working 12 hours a day, really it's seven days a week because the need was always there and now it's greater. It's so much greater for all the reasons all of you have said. So please keep doing pro bono and do it for everyone, not just the protesters, but for the person facing unemployment or the person whose small business has closed down or the person because of illness is at home or the person on the front line who's working in grocery stores or delivering our Amazon boxes or being in hospitals. Please do pro bono because when we work with you and if we work with the lens that we have all shared today, we will be that much stronger. So thank you and see you on June 11th.